welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be focusing upon the story of the Etchinswell doll, a victim whose identity was a baffling mystery. The investigation into who this woman was took police officers to different countries and truly went worldwide. The mystery of her death and her identity caused a huge investigation and would eventually result in a very surprising discovery. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Etchinswell is a village in the county of Hampshire, in the southeast of the UK. It is a rural and sleepy village, surrounded by fields and farms. Today it is best known as being the location of Watership Down, a down which is popular with walkers and cyclists. It is famous for having an Iron Age hill fort at its summit, and it is also famous as being the location of the well-known 1970s book of the same name. On the 30th of September 1975, a cowman named Jock Stewart was about a mile away from the centre of the village. He was travelling along a hedge-lined road and happened to look over towards an overgrown drain behind a demolished cottage on Hyde Lane. Mr Stewart went around to look closer at the drain and came across something extremely disturbing. He saw the dead body of a woman hidden in a small group of trees. It is reported in the Reading Evening Post on the 8th of October that the woman's body was almost naked and curled up and wrapped in a bed blanket. The body was quite well hidden and could not be seen from the main road. The area in which the body had been found was not visited often by locals and the body could have lain there for much longer if not discovered by Mr Stewart. He contacted police who came immediately to the scene and the investigation was taken on by the acting head of Hampshire CID, Detective Superintendent Harry Pillbeam and Detective Superintendent Stan Atkinson, who was the crime coordinator for North Hampshire. A large investigation began and the first thing that was done was to analyse the crime scene. As the woman was found out in the open, there was an awful lot to sift through. It is reported that an inch-by-inch search was conducted and all objects that may have had something to do with the murder were collected. This included very usual household objects and rubbish, such as old cans and wrappers. There was, however, not much to go on at the scene and nothing appeared to be relevant to the woman's body. What exactly had happened to this woman, and importantly, who was she? The woman was naked except for a pair of white briefs that had flowers on. This did not provide any information as to her identity, as the briefs did not even have a label in them that could point to where they had been purchased. There was no identification of any sort found around the body, and unfortunately this did not help the investigation. The detectives got to work analysing the missing person records in the area, however this was also a huge task as there were a number of women that matched the same description as the woman that they had found. She was described as having long dark hair and it was reported that she had dark pigmented skin. It was thought that she was between the ages of 18 and 25 and around 5 feet 2 inches tall. She had two scars, one was an appendix scar and one was a scar below the right knee. She also had a small mole on the outer side of her left calf. It is reported that she had naturally white teeth and did not have her ears pierced. One notable feature was that she appeared to have an unusual right thumbnail that looked like it may have had some new nail growth. It looked like she had once worn a ring on the middle finger of her left hand. Police thought that this might have suggested that she had perhaps been married in a country where the ring was worn on a different finger. The body was taken to be examined in the hope that a post-mortem may point to what had happened to her or even give the police more clues as to where she was originally from. The post-mortem concluded that the woman had most probably been strangled. A plastic bag had been placed over the woman's head. There were no signs of sexual assault and it did not appear that there had been a struggle as the woman didn't have any defence wounds. It was thought, in fact, after examination, that the woman had had little sexual experience in her lifetime. The body was believed to have been there for around two to three weeks before its discovery. Her hair contained traces of cornflour, which could have come from an environment she had been in, perhaps a factory, or it was theorised that the woman could have used the flour as a form of dry shampoo. 
The woman's stomach contents were also analysed and it was found that she had consumed wheat, some mushrooms and some root vegetables before she died. It was thought at the time that this may indicate that the woman was a vegetarian, as the wheat was relatively unusual and was often found in vegetarian foods and meals. Pumpernickel seeds were also found in her stomach contents. An interesting development was made when traces of a laxatine drug and tranquilizer drug were found in her stomach and liver. This was perhaps suggestive of why there may have not been signs of a struggle. The police were of the opinion that the murder may not have taken place at the scene where she was found, as she was discovered wrapped up in a blanket that had been tied with electrical flex. It appeared that she had been transported to the scene and been left in an open drain. The theory was developing that as there was no signs of a sexual assault, the woman had been stripped in an effort to remove all identifying features. An incident room was set up at Whitchurch Police Station, and the huge investigation continued on. The police circulated the description not only to other police forces in the UK, but due to the theory that she may be from abroad, they also reportedly sent her description to 29 other countries. Police decided to enlist the help of a makeup artist who produced a death mask for the woman so that the public could get an idea of what she had looked like when she was alive. This death mask was published in many newspapers with an appeal for anyone that may have recognised the woman to come forward. Due to the woman's small features, she began to be known as the Etchinswell doll. The main priority was to try and identify the woman and then investigate who could have murdered her. In the weeks following her discovery, the detectives tried a number of different things to understand who she was. Interpol became involved and worked with detectives to spread the search out even further. It was reported that with Interpol's help, they were able to whittle down 1,300 missing women to just 26 who had not been traced. In the few months after the discovery, a breakthrough was made in the investigation. Police had managed to narrow down where the woman was from using the little evidence that had been at the scene, the briefs that she had been wearing. Despite there being no label left in the briefs, police had tracked down where they had been manufactured and also sold. They found that they had been manufactured in Germany and were part of a special line that was sold from January to July 1974, the previous year. The interesting part about this was that the briefs had not been sold outside of Germany and so the woman must have been there in 1974. This was a huge breakthrough as the police were able to focus their efforts on Germany. While this was still a massive undertaking, it was perhaps not as much a needle in the haystack as it had been before. Detective Superintendent Stan Atkinson stated in the Reading Evening Post, The investigation strongly indicates a European connection, and the deceased may be of German origin, or someone who has worked, lived or spent some time in Germany. Other items of evidence were then analysed and it was found that the flex that had been used to tie up the blanket was also made in Germany, further corroborating the theory that the woman had lived or at least spent some time in the country. What then was she doing in a drain in the small village of Etchenswell? Despite the breakthrough, they were not any closer to giving the woman an identity or explaining how she had ended up there. Police turned to the local community and area to see if anyone had perhaps seen the woman or noted anything suspicious around the time that the body was dumped. Police visited people door to door in the hope that they would gain some important information and an appeal was put out to the community. Some possible sightings did come in. It's reported in the Reading Evening Post on the 8th of October that a woman named Ivy Mitchell thought she had seen a woman that fit the description in Etchinswell. She said that she had entered the shop where Mrs Mitchell worked and as it had been raining heavily, her hair was wet and it looked as though she had been walking. Mrs Mitchell thought she may be getting a lift as it appeared she had gone into the shop for shelter and she didn't think that the woman would have gone on walking much further. The woman spoke to Mrs Mitchell and told her that she was on her way back from visiting a friend in Kingsclear and that she had just nipped into the shop. She also told her that she was going to university the next day to study a scientific subject. This sighting was around the 16th of September, therefore would have been around the correct time that the body was left in the drain. 
The police believed that this sighting was important and started to investigate whether they could rule this woman out as the victim. Mrs Mitchell did say she had a local accent, however she had never seen her in the area before. This of course did not necessarily fit the profile of the woman that they were looking for, however she could not be immediately ruled out. Sightings also came in from a taxi driver, around a year after the discovery, who stated that he had given a man and a woman a ride from Wokingham to Greenham Air Base, a few days before the discovery of the body. He explained that the woman did have a foreign accent. While this was also an interesting lead, it again did not necessarily fit, as the body was thought to have been in that location for around two weeks before the discovery. Following on from this tip, however, the police even had cause to speak to John Lennon and Paul McCartney, as on the journey the woman had said that she had once worked with the Beatles. The police spoke to Lennon and McCartney, who both said that they didn't know her. Other tips came in that were quite sensational, such as the theory that the woman had been part of the Spanish Secret Service and that she had gone missing on a mission in Germany. In an article that came out in Spanish magazine Cambio, it was theorised that the woman had then been killed by the CIA as she was carrying secret documents. This, like many of the other tips that came in, went nowhere. In 1977, two years after the murder, a TV documentary was aired which showed a new artist's impression of the woman, along with the death mask image. This reportedly brought in a large number of calls about who the woman was, and the police were inundated with new tips. Despite this appeal on the TV, none of the tips led to the woman's identity. Four years after the murder, the police were still none the wiser about who the woman was or what had happened to her. It's reported in the Reading Evening Post on the 9th of August 1979 that the detectives involved in the case were extremely disappointed about the lack of progress. Detective Sergeant Stovell, who attended the scene, stated when asked what he believed happened. My own view after four years is that I have a very open mind. I honestly don't know. Detective Chief Superintendent Holdaway, who is described as the top detective in Hampshire, retired in 1979 and expressed his sadness that the case was still unsolved. Detective Superintendent Harry Pillbeam, who has also been heavily involved in the case, continued on investigating it after Holdaway retired. Despite the thorough investigation that had been carried out, it did not appear that the case was going to be solved any time soon, as the leads that had come in had all gone cold. This, however, was not the end to the Etchingswell doll story, and two years later in 1981, there was a huge development in the case. Following on from all the coverage that police did in both the UK and Europe, someone did finally recognise the Etchingswell doll. A woman in Hamburg had gone to authorities in Germany to report her daughter Jeanette Hinch missing. She explained that her daughter lived in London with her husband Ulf Hinch, but that she hadn't seen or been in contact with her for over five years. There had always been the suspicion that the Etchingswell doll had been from Germany, and as a result the German police contacted the detectives in Hampshire. It is reported in the Reading Evening Post on the 11th of April 1981 that Detective Superintendent John Carruthers from Hampshire Police travelled to Hamburg, Germany to interview Jeanette's mother. She was shown the death mask picture of the victim, and she confirmed that she did indeed look like Jeanette. Further investigations done by Interpol revealed that the dental records did match the Etchingswell doll. They had finally identified her as Jeanette Hinch. The detective's hunch that she had been from Germany was proven to be correct, and the investigations that had been conducted were accurate. Sadly for Jeanette's mother, the worst had been confirmed. It would later turn out that her mother had watched the TV documentary that had been aired about the Etchingswell doll case, amongst others. Of course, at the time, Jeanette's mother had no idea that it was in fact her daughter that they were talking about. The detectives now had to carry on with the investigation into what exactly had happened to her. They were now armed with more information about Jeanette's life than they had previously, and it's reported that 20 detectives were brought in to trace Jeanette's movements and try and solve what had led to her being dumped in Etchingswell. The police now knew that Jeanette had been living in Mill Hill in the London borough of Barnet with her husband, Ulf Hinch, who worked for a shipping company. 
This is what their investigation focused on and particularly trying to trace Jeanette's movements during 1975. It wasn't long before an arrest was made in the case. Later on in April, not long after the identification of Jeanette's body, her husband Ulf was arrested for her murder. It was reported that when the arrest happened, Ulf Hinch appeared calm and not at all surprised about the arrival of the police. He was now living in Essex with a Dutch woman who he had a child with. When he was interviewed initially, Ulf explained that Jeanette had left after an argument that the pair had had, and that he had not seen her since. He said, we had an argument because I had to go to London. She said, I will not be here when you get back. He explained that their relationship had not been good for several years, and that they hadn't slept together for a while, both sleeping in different beds. He also stated that he believed Jeanette was pregnant with another man's child at the time that she left him. Ulf stated that Jeanette had left of her own volition. Despite his version of events, the police were unconvinced and decided to charge Ulf Hinch with the murder of his wife. This was national news and it seemed remarkable that not only the Etchingswell doll had been identified, but also an arrest had been made in the same month. It took several months before the trial was opened at Winchester Crown Court on the 23rd of November 1981. Mr David Calcutt QC was prosecuting the case and presented information that Ulf Hinch had answered some of Jeanette's mother Gretchen's letters to him. He explained to her that Jeanette had disappeared from the house and that he had reported this to Mill Hill Police. This, however, was not the case, and it was clear that Ulf had never actually reported Jeanette's disappearance, despite what he had said to her mother. Gretchen was very suspicious of Ulf because of how he had reacted to her questions, and it is reported that in one letter to him she stated, I shall dig deeper and deeper. Do you have a guilty conscience? Do you perhaps know something after all and don't want to bring it out into the open? Ulf Hinch denied all charges and pleaded not guilty to murder and also to preventing her inquest and burial. In the first week of the trial, a number of other facts about the case came out. Mr Arnold Russell Vick, QC, for the defence, stated that Mr Hinch believed that his wife had left him for another man. The defence went on to say that Mr Hinch was told by Jeanette's brother that she had confided in him that she was pregnant with another man's baby. The other important testimony came from the Home Office pathologist Horace Kennard about Jeanette's cause of death. He stated that the bag on her head and the electrical flex that had been wrapped around the body did not cause her death and that in fact she had died from a heart attack caused by the strangulation. Horace Kennard also stated that he believed that there was not a lot of pressure used or necessary to cause this strangulation. This was corroborated by the fact that an internal examination of Jeanette's body showed no bruising of the soft tissue in her neck. This testimony led to a huge development in the trial when Mr Justice Webster, who was overseeing the trial, advised the jury to return a not guilty verdict on the murder charge but to continue to try Mr Hinch on a manslaughter charge. The Reading Evening Post on December the 10th reported that Mr Justice Webster stated, A person can only be guilty of murder if his conduct causes the victim's death and if he intends either to kill the victim or seriously injure. He explained how the pathologist had stated only a slight pressure was needed and said, Finally he said in these circumstances the strangulation need only have lasted for a few seconds. It might have only been a tweak. The judge explained that the jury would still have to consider a manslaughter verdict. This was a massive development as the judge was suggesting that as the strangulation may not have been intentional with a view to kill or injure, then they must only consider manslaughter. It was not deemed to be murder as there was only slight pressure needed to cause the heart attack that the pathologist believed Jeanette suffered. Shortly after this decision by the judge, Ulf Hinch himself took to the stand. He once again explained that Jeanette had left him and had said she didn't want to be with him anymore, stating he wasn't even a good insurance for old age. He explained on the stand that he believed that she may have left him for an American airman as she had been on a shopping trip to London one day and came back and told him she had met an American who had something to do with flying. He explained that at the time he didn't take much notice of what she had said. The defence then continued with evidence from Reading taxi driver John Ward, 
who had come forward previously with information about dropping off a woman with a foreign accent and an American man at Greenham Air Base. The defence pointed to the fact that this could have been the man that Jeanette had already told Ulf Hinch about. John Ward testified stating that he got the impression that the couple didn't know each other that well. He then said when the couple left the car, he cleaned it out and found a pink alarm clock in the boot of the car. Mr Hinch said it was virtually identical to a clock that usually sat on their bedside table at home. The defence argued that this could show that there was an alternative theory for what had happened to Jeanette. Mr David Calcutt QC, who was prosecuting, however, outlined a completely different theory on the case. He explained that Jeanette and Ulf had had an argument, possibly relating to the purchase of a house, when he had lost his temper. He said that there was pressure in the relationship, as they had agreed to move out of their house at Mill Hill, but the house that they were going to buy proved to be too expensive. Mr Calcutt stated, The position in the Hinch household was that they had nowhere to live. The sexual side of the marriage had collapsed. There were rows about money. Mrs Hinch was dissatisfied with her lot. She wanted to go back and live in Germany, and he wanted to stay in this country. Did this not lead to a row and an assault? A grab, a squeeze, pressure sustained for a few seconds, but bringing death as the result of a heart attack. He also asked the jury how Jeanette had come to be tied with two lengths of flex that had been manufactured in Germany, and why had he attempted to mislead Jeanette's mother? Mr Russell Vick, for Hinch's defence, however, stated how upset his client was when his wife had left and had told friends that Jeanette had left him and he was devastated. He presented Hinch as a man in distress. His marriage had failed and his wife had gone off with another man. He also indicated to the jury that even if his client was there when his wife died and she had not left him as he had claimed, her death could still have been an accident. The defence once again pointed to the pathologist's evidence. He then went on to say the defendant might have accidentally caused his wife's death, panicked and decided that the only way he could act was to try and dispose of her body. This seemed like a strange defence strategy as it appeared that they were covering all bases in terms of what had happened to Jeanette and were not necessarily keeping to the story that she had left him. After all the testimony had been heard, the jury retired to consider their verdict. The trial had lasted three weeks, however had continually changed, owing to the fact that they now only had manslaughter to consider. The jury returned with a verdict of not guilty on the charge of manslaughter, but did find him guilty of concealing his wife's body and preventing her burial. It was decided that as he had already served eight months in prison before and during the trial, that he would be released immediately. Upon his release, Ulf Hinch expressed, I shall fight to clear my name. I am innocent, and if the police will not help, I shall find out the truth for myself. He then went on to say, I cannot understand the jury's verdict. I cannot believe it. Now I have got to sit down and decide what to do. I don't know who killed my wife, but I know that I didn't do it. Ulf Hinch left the courtroom with his girlfriend Henny and their two-year-old daughter. The trial had not answered many of the questions that those involved in the case had. If Ulf Hinch had concealed her body and prevented her burial, what exactly had happened to her? Was it an accident like had been suggested? The trial had, if anything, presented more questions than answers. At the end of December 1981, the inquest into Jeanette's death was finally closed after being open for over five years. The result of the inquest also didn't answer any of these questions, as the Basingstoke coroner John Clark recorded an open verdict. The inquest was necessary so that a death certificate could finally be issued and Jeanette's family could finally get some closure. The trial had of course come to a conclusion and the jury had decided that Ulf Hinch had not been involved with killing his wife but had prevented her burial. This was the legal decision in the UK, however it was reported in the Reading Evening Post in 1984 that German authorities had asked for the file on Jeanette's death. It was believed that Ulf Hinch could still be tried under German law and that court officials had asked to reopen the case. This appeared not to have gone much further, however. The case of the Etchinswell doll had been a mystery from the beginning and it was a huge achievement that the police had been able to identify Jeanette Hinch. 
The fact that police did not give up in the search for her identity was a testament to the dedication of the detectives, particularly when forensic techniques were not available as they are today. The sad part about the case is that we're still unsure what exactly happened to Jeanette. Did she have an accident that caused her death? Had Ulf Hinge simply panicked as had been suggested at trial and dumped her body? There are still so many questions that deserve answers. I'm so glad I came across this case as I believe that the thorough investigation and later identification of Jeanette shows that even in very confusing unidentified persons cases, there is always hope that they can be solved. I am happy that Jeanette's family finally found out about her death and are not still having to wonder where she is. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Reading Evening Post newspaper through Find My Past has been such a fantastic resource and I would like to credit these contemporary articles for the amazing research I was able to do in this episode. I would love to hear your thoughts about this case, so please do let me know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or our email at theunseenpod at gmail.com. You can also contact me with suggestions for cases you would like to see on the podcast in the future. I would like to thank anyone that continues to support the podcast through Patreon and by leaving us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. I appreciate everyone that helps in any way they can to ensure I can release episodes every week and it definitely means other people can find the podcast and may just give it a go. As always, thank you for listening. I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.